When you have Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse number 1, I want you to signify by saying, I have the bread. It is our custom that we stand for the reading of God's word, and I'm asking you to stand with us. Verse number 1, and the word of the Lord in validity declares that all the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do that ye may live. Somebody say live. That ye may multiply. Somebody say multiply. And go in, somebody say go in, and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee, mm, to humble thee and to prove thee. To know what was in your heart, whether you would actually keep his commandments or not. And he did it. He humbled you and he suffered you to hunger, but he fed you with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he may make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. And all of God's people said, Amen. I may, this may be one of the uh, quickest sermons you ever heard me preach, but I need you to grab somebody by the hand and say, neighbor, you need to hear this word. Tell them you need this message. Said neighbor, it took all of that. I need you to put a praise there. Well, I'm going to preach that. It took all. Uh, I need you to look at somebody else. Did you hear what I said? It took all of that. The good, the bad, the pretty, the ugly. It took all of that. Uh, recently, recently, I've been dealing in my own life about what does it mean to be chosen. Because sometime in our uh, uh, Christian vernacular, we use a lot of words sometimes that we say because it's what we've always heard without a true meaning or an understanding about what that actually means. I've had an uh, issue dealing with sometimes when we're talking about soteriology and we're dealing with theological perspectives concerning salvation about um, stuff like predestination, the election of God and I know y'all got it down packed, but I'm still trying to figure out some of that. I'm trying to figure out in my mind and trying to intellectually try to comprehend, you know, that if I did not choose God, but God chose me, that means my desire to choose him is no goodness of my own, is that he put it in me to actually want him. And so I'm still dealing with that, okay? I'm just going to be honest. I, I'm still trying to deal with that. And then the scripture says, many are called, but few are chosen. So that means even out of all the people who have been called to salvation or called to particular work only, a few of them are chosen. So then, well, wouldn't I be chosen since I've been called? Wasn't, wasn't I chosen to call and then... Um, I looked at one uh, translation because I'm old school, so I'm, I love King James Version. Um, even when I prophesy, I like to prophesy in King James Version. It just sounds more spiritual to me. Yeah, yeah, I say unto thee, not you, thee. Um, but I understand uh, it took me a long time to figure out that Jesus did not speak in old English. He actually spoke in Aramaic. Um, and so uh, I did read another version uh, of that text to help me maybe comprehend it. Maybe it's true. It says, many are called, but few have chosen. That means the call has went out, but only a few have responded to that call. And even your response to that call implies that you were chosen. Mm. And so ever since um, I was born, uh, you know, I shared the testimony so many times that my mother did not uh, plan uh, to raise a boy by herself. Uh, 
she'll share her testimony with it's a powerful testimony of restoration and how some things can happen to you in life that you did not calculate but how God can still get the glory out of it you know she was in church you know in the Pentecostal sanctified church and it's taboo because she's pregnant but it's okay because she's out of school she's a mature woman and she has an engagement ring on her finger and uh, so that means she's going to get married so it's okay and so my father is going to go into the military get stationed try to make a life for her and me and then uh, you know they're going to live happily ever after just for her to get a phone call one day from my father that he had met someone else and married them. And so now she has a boy in her lap, and she says, God, I did not uh, calculate raising him. I'm helping somebody I want to. Calculate raising him by myself. And so with tears in her eyes, she goes to the church. You know, tell your neighbor, whatever goes on in your life, don't leave the church. I'm telling you. I don't go to church because I got it together. Let me be honest with you. I go to church because I'm still trying to work this thing out. Hallelujah. And so she goes to church and she walks up to the pastor and she says to, to him, she says, I want to dedicate him to God because I can't raise him by myself. And so then as I begin to mature, even as Samuel did before Eli in the temple, I begin to grow still don't have a full understanding of who I am. As a matter of fact, there was a constant pursuit of trying to come into a particular identity of who I am. Because a man's identity, a child's identity, comes not just from the nurturing of the mother, but the declaration of the father. It said, I thank God for you mothers. It's nothing like a mother's love, but direction and prophetic uh, direction comes from the declaration of the father. That's why I need to ask you a question. Who is your daddy? I, I know you're anointed and you're spiritual and God got you here, there, and everywhere. But who is your father? Because if you show me your father, I can say something to you about your destiny. There's some young women, the reason why they find themselves in bad and abusive relationships is because they don't have healthy relationships with their father. See, when you have a healthy relationship with your father, there are some things you will not settle to because your identity is not in them. Your identity is in him. My mother gives me to the preacher and says, I need to dedicate him to God. And so then I grew up in this wonderful uh, metropolitan city of Gretna, Virginia. But constantly while I'm growing up, I noticed very soon, at first I thought I was normal. I thought I was normal until I went to school. And then I realized that I was not normal. And so I went through this constant uh, process of trying to fit in and trying to be like everyone else. And in my attempts, the saints would tell me, no, you can't go over there. And you can't do that. I grew up with a woman by the name of Big Catherine. That's what we called her. Mother Catherine Hilton. That was Bishop Hall's uh, aunt. And she used to have tent meet revivals. I know some of y'all have no idea what I'm talking about. I grew up with a group of women. Mother Frances Hall. He said, my godmother. They used to lay hands on me and speak over my life. We, they had something what they call a prayer band. Now, I know this generation, you do not understand what I'm talking about. We understand drive-by shootings, but these are a group of women that used to have drive-by prayer meetings. Ah, oh, prayer bands. I mean, people that would say, oh, I heard Lucy is over there sick. Y'all come over here with me. We're going to go over here and raise her up. I'm talking about when the saints didn't have a pill for everything. Oh, I ain't got no help here. I'm talking about when the saints actually believed the word of God. They did not know theology. They were not strong in eschatology, but they had a bottle of oil. And if they could get a hold of that bottle of oil, they'd run up in there. They didn't need psychologists. They didn't need therapists. They knew how to not cancel a devil. They knew how to cast out a devil. So then I, I found myself constantly having restrictions on me. I mean, it was constant restrictions put on me because they used to tell me, you're chosen. And because you're chosen, you can't go up on the hill with everybody else. Because you're chosen, you can't spend the night at everybody's house. 
Because you're chosen, you can't eat from everybody's table. Because you're chosen, I ain't got no help to hear. You can't wear what everybody else wears. Because you're chosen, you can't do what everybody else do. And I know it sounds exciting to some, but to be honest, it became frustrating. It became frustrating. It became aggravating. It became annoying because it looked like there were more things I could not do than things I could do. And then I would look at others. And when I looked at others, it began to frustrate my carnality because it looked like others were happy doing whatever they wanted to do. But let me stop and tell you for a moment, for you that's looking out the window at others, there's a price, there's a way that seems right unto man, but the end of that way. I know I ain't going to get no help when I start preaching holiness in here. I said the end of that way is destruction. So I'd rather suffer afflictions, help oh shot, with the people of God than enjoy pleasures for a moment. And so I begin to get frustrated because you have to realize being supposedly chosen, whatever that meant for me, I, I found myself not fitting in with my colleagues and my peers. And, and so who I hung out with were people double my age. And so people would say, you got an old spirit. Well, I really had no other choice because I had the spirit of the people I was hanging around. I'm talking about, I mean, I, I had a great childhood, but my Saturday morning included going to yard sales and flea markets. It was not sleeping in. You understand what I'm saying? I mean that 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 I mean that was that was the highlight of you know you know ha, you know talking about like, what are we gonna do to have fun we great to have church what are you talking about we are gonna have a prayer meeting everybody line up let's sing that's all we knew and so then I I didn't I didn't fit in with my with my peers my age and my my company became people older than me and then that became why why I mean, because I'm chosen but that became frustrating because. I begin to have inner warfare of identity, beginning to wonder, was I really saved? Now, I know some of you won't be able to grasp this. I was speaking in tongues, no God had filled me. I was shouting and I was dancing, and every so often, a prophetic utterance would come out of my mouth. But I dealt with, Lord, am I really saved? Because something happens, even when you get the Holy Ghost at a young age, something happens called life when you got to actually grow up and you're not now uh, obsolete from some of the same things and challenges. Uh, don't y'all look at me like that. 